Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for 292 Baby Educational Videos, Support for Parents and Caregivers of Infants. I would like you to know that all of the experts featured in our video series have given freely of their time and all are from the Early Childhood Community of Greater Rochester. On behalf of everyone affiliated with the 292 Baby Project, we wish you the very best of luck with your children. 292 Baby is a community collaboration administered by Monroe Community College. And this week we're doing, dealing with over-the-counter drugs, and today specifically we're looking at diaper rash. And we're thrilled to have with us um, Dr. Lynn Dykstra. And Lynn, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be here. Okay. <laughs> Lynn is a, uh, a doctor, a pediatrician, and a pediatric resident at the Golisano Children's Hospital at Strong. And today we're talking diaper rashes. And, and it wasn't so long ago my kids were little, and I'm just so familiar with this, with the whole issue. And I think all parents who have young children deal with diaper rashes. But one of the big problems, you walk into the store, and right off the bat, you're just kind of overwhelmed with all the different products that are available and not knowing so much necessarily what to, not just what is available, but how to kind of sort your way through. Um, we took a, a stroll through a, a Wegmans store and just took, took a look out at the, uh, the baby aisle down in, um, um, what is it, the Webster store uh, out in Wegmans there. And just looking down the aisle, and here's an example of just the kind of things that you see. And to be honest, I was just overwhelmed. There's so many choices that parents have for that. Um, any thoughts on that? Do you find that? I, I fully agree with you, and I, I don't even know how parents kind of sort their way through the Wegmans aisles these days. Mm -hmm. There's so many products to choose from. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think one of the important things to remember is that there's, there's really not all that much difference between generic products and, and name brand products, mm -hmm. and so that, that can really make your choices a lot easier, I think. Yeah. So if you're looking at a Wegmans product, as a generic product, right. just as good as a just as good as another product. And here's some more Absolutely. examples of um, just what you'll see. Actually, good information. This baby island Wegmans was I was impressed with it in the sense that it had uh, um, information for folks. It's a good problem, I think, to have so many choices, but the, uh, <laughs> but they are wonderful choices. But right off the bat, if you're looking at a product like a Wegmans product, it's a generic. It's to be considered generic as opposed to uh, a brand name. Right. And Typically, they're just, just as good, and they're, and they're usually right next to each other, aren't they, on the islands? Right. We can see here with the different, with the different products. We've got Johnson Johnson and there Dyson and Bell. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all of the many choices. Okay. And as a pediatrician, <laughs> these are all products you're very familiar with, yep. I take it. Yeah, okay. and these are a lot of products that parents ask us about all the time. Yeah, okay. So um, even though it's a good problem that you have this many choices, okay. um, it is all related back to the issue of diaper rash. Right. And um, is that a pretty common thing? It's an extremely common thing. I can't tell you how many times a day we have parents come in and bring their children in. And really, this is a problem of children who are not yet to toilet trained, mm -hmm. hence the name diaper rash. <laughs> sure. Um, and, and obviously, that relates to the fact that, that when you're in a diaper, you're trapping the urine and the stool against the child's skin and, mm -hmm. and in a plastic bag, essentially. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that's not a natural way to be. So. If their skin gets irritated, then they can have problems with diaper rash. So. Yeah. I know that um, um, it, when with my kids, when they would get it, I was always frightened by it. You know, it just, I guess it looks so bad. I it can. can. Remember it can look terrible. One of the kids just having this, it just spread right out over the whole bottom, and it was just, uh, um, I thought it would make them miserable. It would make me miserable <laughs> to have that. And uh, I think it certainly can be uncomfortable for a child, and, and certainly that's one of the reasons to treat it, mm -hmm. along with the fact that the longer a diaper rash stays on a child, the more likely it is to get super infected either with bacteria or yeast. Mm -hmm. But usually the typical diaper rash that we see is just, um, is, is not really an infection, but more of an irritation of the skin. Mm -hmm. Do you find parents very concerned about them? Yeah, parents can be very concerned. I've certainly had parents come into the emergency department for diaper rash, mm -hmm. which is not necessary. Certainly, uh, almost in every instance, diaper rash is something that can wait and you can see your pediatrician in the morning for. But Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so it is very common. Mm -hmm. It's something that every parent of a child, and you know, just uh, what we're looking for in today's show pretty much is just uh, a general primer about it and, and what you can do about it and the causes of it and everything. But it does strike me that um, I know my kids were in diapers for three years, and so it's not unusual at all to have a child in diaper for three years, and it's two kids. So for six years, uh, my family was involved with the whole issue of right. diapers. So it's not a it's not a it's not a trivial issue. No, it's not. <laughs> and what you know about it, and if you can if you can um, deal with it, I guess it makes it better for you in the long run. Right. So I agree. Okay. So you um, causes of diaper rash. There are certainly many causes of diaper rash, but 
the most common cause of diaper rash is, again, just the contact of the urine and the stool against the child's skin. Mm -hmm. So the longer that that stays in contact with your child's skin, the more likely they are. Those are chemicals, really, that your child is urinating out. There's, there's ammonia in the urine, and mm -hmm. there's certain chemicals in the stool, and those are very irritating against their skin, mm -hmm. and that can start to cause breakdown of the skin and irritation of the skin. Okay. So the diaper, while it's designed to contain everything, Thing, the fact that it's doing a good job is the problem. <laughs> exactly right. right. I mean, yeah. Exactly right. And I think that it, traditionally, when when in generations past, uh, cloth diapers were more common. Mm -hmm. They, those were much more breathable and there was much less uh, diaper rash associated with them unless the parents then put the plastic or the rubber pants over the over the diapers. Right, um, which is exactly what we did. <laughs> now we had the we had the. Um, cloth diapers and mm -hmm. had them delivered. I don't think there's a service here in town anymore that does that, <laughs> um, to be honest. But there are still some people, I'm sure, who own their own diapers and um, the cloth diapers and then they clean them themselves and that, which mm -hmm. is a huge job. Right. Um, but is cloth better than? Um, you know, I think it all depends on who you ask, truly. I yeah. think certainly there are people who much prefer the cloth diapers and many people who much prefer the disposable diapers mm -hmm. because disposable diapers, let's face it, are very convenient. Yeah. Yeah, but in terms of diaper rash, does one contribute to the other? Of course, with the cloth diapers. With the cloth diapers, they're much more breathable, mm -hmm. but yet it's really not pl practical to have a cloth diaper without those rubber pants right. pulled right. up over them because yeah. otherwise it's just going to leak through the cloth diaper and onto the child's clothing, and the whole point of a diaper is to not get their clothes dirty. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Um, so if, as soon as they put the plastic over the cloth diaper, it's the same thing essentially as a as a regular diaper, disposable okay. diaper. Okay. So maybe if my wife and I could go back, <laughs> we'd go with disposable <laughs> instead of all the time it took, because it does take more time and uh, right. um, it is very convenient with the disposable ones. But now there is there's one other issue which is certainly an environmental issue and mm -hmm. the the whole issue of filling up our landfills with disposable diapers as opposed to washing the sure. cloth diapers. And sure. I think that's one of the main reasons why people choose cloth diapers still today. Yeah. If people do choose cloth diapers today, and the chances are, at least in our town, that they are cleaning them themselves, mm -hmm. is there any advice in terms of what to use to clean or how to clean or is there anything they should avoid? Well, I think that's a good question. Um, certainly, there, certainly in towns where there are diaper services, and I truly don't know if there's a diaper service in this town, but there isn't. okay, <laughs> um, then then I would go with the diaper cleaning service purely because um, they have the skills to clean the diapers very well, mm -hmm. and um, and you don't have to deal with the waste issue as mm -hmm. far as in your whole laundry process. Yep. But if you do decide to do cloth diapers at home, I think. Um, it, it would be important to choose a detergent that's very mild, um, and it would be important to use very, very hot water to clean the diapers. Yep. So you want to use your maximum hot setting on your on your washing machine, and you want to use a detergent that's going to be mild to your child's skin, so not a lot of dyes and not a lot of perfumes. Mm -hmm. So some of them actually say clear on them or exactly. free, of, free of dyes. You exactly. should look for that. For, mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so we do have... Um, the diaper, whether it's the cloth or the or the disposable ones, and it's trapping the urine and the stools there against the child's skin. Right. And the different chemicals in there, like ammonia, mm -hmm. are actually what's causing the diaper rash. So, not dry. You said there were three reasons. Right. So that's one reason why so they got it. That's one reason. Exactly right. Uh, another reason is. A less common reason, but certainly we have infants and small children who get ear infections or other types of infections that require them to be on antibiotics. And antibiotics, while very good in fighting off infections, also throw the balance of the, our body's natural bacteria and natural yeast, they throw it out of whack. So mm -hmm. we, I mean, our bodies normally contain both bacteria and yeast, and it's in this very fine balance. Mm -hmm. And when you take an oral antibiotic, you're killing off some of those bacteria. And so the yeast kind of maybe get a little out of control. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and that can be one of the causes. So a parent who is um, a conscious of diaper rash and that if their child is being treated for something with an antibiotic, mm -hmm. might talk in the back of their minds, ah, let me make sure I'm checking maybe a little closer right. for diaper rash. Right. And you know, I was just thinking in association with antibiotics is it's very common for children on say amoxicillin or some other antibiotics mm -hmm. to actually have much more looser stools, even diarrheal stools mm -hmm. on the antibiotic. And diarrhea, whether from an antibiotic or just because your child has some kind of a little virus infection that's mm -hmm. causing them to have diarrhea, 
just that increased frequency of the stooling mm -hmm. can cause irritation of the diaper area and yeah. the diaper rash. Okay. And if I remember right, <laughs> and I do, is that when my kids had diarrhea, it seemed to find its way <laughs> into places that a normal stool wouldn't. They would be wearing it pretty. Uh, Absolutely. So, so that's actually even a bigger area, I think, might be affected by that. Right. Minor point, but. Uh, well, uh, not a minor point, really, yeah. because you're absolutely right, and I think it's critical, especially when your child has diarrhea, and we can talk about this a little later, but mm -hmm. cleaning in every nook and cranny can be even more important. Yeah, okay, all right. So that's two reasons, so mm -hmm. antibiotics and not being dry. Right. And, and then another reason is um, that there can be, if your child's diaper is on too tight or if you've bought the wrong size diaper, any number of reasons, you can actually just have what's called chafing dermatitis. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know that chafing is just the irritation of the diaper against the skin. And I think we particularly notice that along the waistband and along the, where the leg bands are that you can see some chafing dermatitis. Mm -hmm. So it'd be important to not put the diaper on too tight. What happens then? It's on so, so tight on the skin? How does that it really, every time your child moves, the diaper kind of uh -huh. moves, but in the opposite direction, and so yeah. it's always kind of irritating their skin. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah. So three different reasons that uh, yeah. parents should be aware of. So um, probably a good advice for parents is to have a plan on the whole issue of diapers, on just how you're going to do it in those first uh, two or three years, and, uh, and recognize that it, without a plan, you may have to pay a, a bigger price later. Exactly. So, okay. Exactly. How about children's diet? Is that related to? Yeah, that's actually a, a good point that you raise because certainly I think parents have noticed at times when they change either from breastfeeding to formula feeding, mm -hmm. from one formula to another a little less commonly, but specifically when they introduce solids, that that can be a cause of a change in their child's stooling habits mm -hmm. and therefore a change in the, it's almost really a change in the chemical composition of the stools. Mm -hmm. It may be a little bit more acidic or a little bit more basic and either way it's a little more irritating to their skin and can also cause a rash. Yeah. You know, I remember, and I didn't believe this when I first heard it, that when um, a child, a child stools when they're being nursed, that they were, didn't smell at all. And I found that was really true, but is there um, less of a chemical that would harm the child's skin while they're being nursed? Well, I think, you know, certainly breastfeeding is the most natural way to go mm -hmm. um, as far as getting the nutrients in your child. Um, and. I don't know that there's any difference as far as the pH goes or the, the chemical balance goes mm -hmm. in the stool that comes out after, yeah. after okay. a feeding. Probably what's unnatural is to keep it tucked in and packed against the child's skin. Exactly yeah, right. That's, that's, uh, exactly if I think right. of humans in the natural setting of being nomadic, where they're just going, they probably just held the kids out and uh, um, clean them, them right up thing. on the spot. <laughs> yeah, right, right. This week we are dealing with over-the-counter remedies and specifically today we're looking at diaper rash and we are with Dr. Lynn Dykstra and Lynn is a pediatric uh, um, resident at the Golisano Children's Hospital at Strong and a lot of good information so far. We're talking diaper rash. Every parent of a young kid has to face this. Absolutely. Three causes we've covered so far. One is that um, um, the child is just not kept dry enough. Mm -hmm. The second one was that the, um, uh, they might be being treated with antibiotics and during that time they're more likely to have a diaper rash. And the third one was, uh, I've forgotten the third one. Too tight on the diapers. Oh, that's right, too tight on the diapers. <laughs> Any other cause? Are you paying attention to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On my written test afterwards. Um, other, other causes? You know, I was thinking of one other cause. It's, it's certainly not a common cause, but it can be a cause, and that is if there's some kind of product or, or Anything that's touching your child's skin that the child is allergic to, that can certainly cause a, a, a rash on the child's skin. Mm -hmm. So really any product, either the soap that you're using, the baby wipe that you're using, the diaper that you're using, the detergent that you're using, any of those things can certainly cause a rash mm -hmm. anywhere on the child. You might expect it to be a more all over rash than mm -hmm. specifically located to the diaper unless it's a product that you just use in the diaper area. Okay. So, um, you know, it's like when parents introduce new foods, they take them one at a time to right. see if there's any kind of an allergic reaction. Might not be a bad idea for parents if they're looking at a new soap, for example, or a new, new, new product that they're going to use to actually think about the possibility that their child might be allergic to it. Absolutely. Okay. Because I, I wouldn't typically think that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, oh, all products are okay, but you could have... Absolutely. If you have reaction. a child with sensitive skin for one reason or another, it might run in your family, it might just be your child. Yeah. It, it certainly can be a cause of a rash. Okay. 
All right, so so far we've established and we've looked at the different types of diapers and uh, what the problems are there and the different causes of it. Now maybe we can go into prevention. How can, how can parents prevent this from happening? Absolutely. Always the best way, probably. And I think that ties right into the causes, which is the first cause we talked about was the child not staying dry enough. Mm -hmm. So extremely important to change your child frequently, to be constantly checking to see if your child has a wet or a dirty diaper. Mm -hmm. And really very common that parents should be changing their child eight, 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. I think that number, eight or 10 times a day, might shock parents. Because it's I a think lot of diapers. It is a lot of diapers, <laughs> and it's a lot of diaper changes. And di diaper changing, I think, I guess, unfortunately, a lot of parents might not see that as a, um, as a fun time to have. You know, it's a, um, but a great time to interact with a child. It's a great time to interact with your child. It's truly one-on-one -on -one time where you can capture your child's attention and really talk with your child and interact with your child and smile with your child and mm -hmm. play games with your child. Mm -hmm. and. Really, it's a very special time, and you could even take a few extra minutes to spend with your child. And yep. we know from the research that children's little children's brains are continuing to grow even after they are born. Mm -hmm. So the more time you spend talking with your child and interacting with your child, the smarter they're going to be when they mm -hmm. grow up. You know, a lot of parents might not think that by talking an extra, say, five, let's say you added five minutes to your diaper change, and you were doing it eight or ten times a day, that's 40 or 50 minutes a day. Of talking with your child. Research shows, doesn't it, that by age two, a child that's been talked to that much more has a larger vocabulary. Absolutely. They absorb vocabulary better and for the rest of their life will. Yep. So really the foundation of literacy and reading. So you've got a one day old, you're talking to him during a diaper change, parents should reward themselves and say, I'm helping to make my baby a better reader. Absolutely. You know, something they might not think of uh, from a diaper change. Right. They might find the diaper change an annoyance, but really you could turn it around and really make it a learning session for your child. Yeah, yeah. And certainly sometime in that interaction. And I can remember with the kids um, looking at them, even at a couple months old, you know, we'd be interacting, going back and forth. And if they were tired of it, they'd look away. You know, they would send the message, Dad, I've had enough. You know, and like, I'm only six weeks old, but, you know, here's your hat. What's your hurry? We're done, we're done talking right now. But a diaper change. And so if the whole thing can be a positive experience, then uh, you can get rid of diaper rash and make your child a better reader at the same time. Absolutely. Two things might not be connected. Okay, so prevention, you got to keep them dry eight to ten times a day. Right. I mean, and you really need to be on top of it. And, and that means really just checking their diapers frequently. And mm -hmm. especially before you put them down to go to bed. You want to make sure that they go to bed with the dry diaper. And really before you go to bed then, go ahead and check the diaper. Okay. All right. Other preventions. So I think now would be a good time since we're talking about diaper changing to mm -hmm. talk about the, the products. Okay. Um, All right. It's very common for parents to come in and ask us, which product should I use? Mm -hmm. um, and really many of them are very good and you don't have to buy necessarily a name brand product. Okay. Um, but both Desitin and Balmex are two examples here of ointments that have zinc in them. Mm -hmm. Zinc can be a very protective and very healing um, ointment. And, um, and then another common one that parents use is A and D ointment, and that mm -hmm. has some vitamins in it that help the skin heal as well. Yep. Um, so after you're done changing the diaper, you make sure the skin is completely dry before you put this on? Or right, it... right. So you bring a good point, which is clearly you want to make sure that the child's skin is very clean mm -hmm. and very dry. Mm -hmm. Um, and that may mean, that may be your five minutes while the skin is drying that you spend talking with your child. Yeah. Um, but you want to make sure that you use very soft cloth if you need to dry the skin. Mm -hmm. Nothing that's going to further irritate the skin because otherwise you're going backwards instead of forwards. Yeah. I remember cleaning with baby wipes and those uh -huh. wipes seem to dry quickly. I don't yeah. know if it's quicker than water or are they designed to do well, that? Well, it's, it's a good point. Certain wipes actually have alcohol in them which can be very irritating to a child's mm -hmm. skin and very drying to a child's skin. So I usually recommend parents don't buy wipes with alcohol okay. in them. Mm -hmm. And if your child has a true uh, diaper rash, I usually recommend just water and some mild soap as the best okay. treatment. Yeah. Certainly, if they had that and you used alcohol, that would hurt, wouldn't it, with the kids? Exactly. Okay. All right, so both of these. How about the powders? Do you recommend powders after? Um, I don't often recommend the powders. Sometimes they do help with absorbing a little bit. Mm -hmm. Specifically, we tell parents to avoid talc powder. Mm -hmm. That's a very fine powder that can actually be inhaled and cause actually a pneumonia or an irritation in the child's lungs. So mm -hmm. do not use talc powder um, on your child's bottom or anywhere. 
Um, and the other one is cornstarch, and we don't really recommend that one either. I know okay. that's co a common home remedy, yep. but really some of these ointments are a little better at actually putting a protective layer. You know, really what they do is they kind of block the irritation. They put a protective coating down. Mm -hmm. So some people even just will use the Vaseline petroleum jelly mm -hmm. as a protective coating. It may not have some of these um, vitamins like the zinc and the A and D that um, help heal the skin, mm -hmm. but it is at least a protective coating. Yeah, so better than nothing would be uh, petroleum jelly. Right. And better than that would be something that had the medications in them. Exactly. Okay. Is, um, you know, when we talk about the diaper rash, there's different types, are mm -hmm. there? And, mm -hmm. you know, what should parents know about that? Right. There are different types, and I think um, this ties into maybe really when you should go and see your doctor mm -hmm. um, if there's a concern. Um, certainly we talked about the chafing um, diaper rash where there's just the irritation from the diaper rubbing against the child's skin and mm -hmm. the solution to that is either loosening up the straps or buying a larger size diaper. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's certainly just an irritation diaper rash, a chemical irritant in that. Again, mm -hmm. we talked about keeping your child dry, frequently changing the diapers, that sort of thing. Um, the If you for some reason, don't change your child's diapers frequently enough. Um, you can certainly, after several days, have a super infection, an infection of bacteria and yeast in the diaper. Mm -hmm. So those would be infections that would need a more serious treatment, sometimes um, just a topical ointment mm -hmm. and sometimes something more. Um, but the most common one that we see is yeast, and yeast is if your child has a rash that has little red dots on the outsides of the rash and is specifically involving the kind of the groin creases, mm -hmm. that's a yeast infection because yeast like to grow where it's nice and moist. Okay. That okay. requires either like a Lotrimin cream or, um, or maybe seeing your doctor. Okay. So that speaks to what you said earlier about every nook and cranny. You want to get exactly. everything cleared out. And then the oh. only other thing would be is if you saw pustules or big uh, pimples with fluid in them, that would be a reason to go see your doctor for sure. Okay, good. Dr. Lynn Dykstra, thank you so much for exploring Thanks. diaper rash. There's a lot of information and uh, good for parents to know and to help prevent it from happening in the, in the first place. And, uh, and that can be done. So thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks okay. for having me. We're going to um, go to a, to a taped interview we have. And I think a, a resource a lot of parents might not consider is the pharmacist that they that's at their disposal, whether they're in a grocery store like Wegmans um, or in a drugstore. Pharmacists are a good source of information about what is in some of the products that we're going to be dealing with in the second half of the show. And um, so we went to the, uh, um, the Aronic White Wegman store and we interviewed Bob Klotch. And Bob is a, uh, the pharmacist manager over at, the, over at that store. And um, what we have coming up is that interview. Bob, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, a lot of questions I imagine that people do have about their kids and the dosage and um, the pharmacy is a great resource. Um, as far as fever reducers, what's best for, for a baby? Well, really the best thing is Tylenol. Tylenol is a great fever reducer um, for kids who are six months and less. It's important that we don't give them ibuprofen. It's just not recommended for that age group. Um, so Tylenol really seems to be the best fever reducer for patients and it's easily dosable for any age. I can remember with my kids not knowing whether or not, you know, if you get you get something that says, okay, this is good for kids over six, what do you do if it's younger, under six? How do you handle that? And, and that's a great question. You know, we, we asked to come to the pharmacist. Uh, a lot of medications aren't dosed for those appropriate uh, kids, and, and we can do that through either calculations through weight or calling your physician, getting in contact with your physician and figuring out what would be the best dose for your patient. And uh, really communication is the biggest thing so that we can get the appropriate dose for that patient and so you're not overdosing your, your, your child. So you'd, you'd like it when people come with those kinds of questions? Absolutely, yeah, we encourage it, we really do. I think a big question too for us I know when we were kids and even now for me is generic product versus um, brand name products. Is there a difference and what should we know about it? Well, you know, the cost is the biggest driving force to a lot of it for the brand versus generic uh, battle, so to speak. But really, um, a lot of people think that a generic product is a lesser product. And really, it's the same active ingredient, maybe a little different inactive ingredients. But for the most part, by FDA regulations, it's got to be the same active ingredient. So people do have that misconception, and I encourage them to really research that. And it could be a good cost savings on top of everything. You know, combining drugs seems to be a, a question, too. Can you combine cough and cold medicines, for example, with Tylenol? 
Well, it's important that, that you're, again, coming and speaking with the pharmacist because if you don't, um, some medications that are cough and cold contain Tylenol, and you would hate to give your child Tylenol on top of something that has Tylenol already in it. So we encourage, again, to come and speak to the pharmacist if you have questions um, so we can give you the right direction. I imagine you get a lot of questions from parents. Is there one that's most common? What can I give my child? You know, uh, cough and cold season's right around the corner, and it's hitting us now. Um, they want to know what they can give their child, whether it's a baby, whether it's a young kid, or whether he's actually now kind of in the teens where he's in between an adult dose and a child dose. So really come and speak to the pharmacist. Call your physicians. Uh, best communication is going to help your child and help you, obviously. You know, I often don't think of the pharmacist as a resource, but right here, right in Wegmans, we have a great resource for those, that information. Absolutely, and we encourage anybody, no matter what question, uh, no question is too silly to ask, and we encourage you to come down. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. What we'd like to do is bring to you some newborn tips this week, and many of these tips are just common advice that you may or may not have heard before, but I'd like to start out with one important safety message, and that is never shake a baby. You've seen the commercials, shaking a baby can be very harmful, and we just want to get that message out over and over again. So try not to, in even if a fit of frustration or even an attempt to soothe your baby, shaking is not what we want to do. Cuddling, holding, rocking, those are all fine. If you find yourself feeling that frustrated, just go ahead and let your baby down. Sleeping patterns. Newborns do sleep a lot, and they can sleep up to 18 to 20 hours. So if you find your, your baby's just sleeping excessively, as long as he's waking at three to four hours, he's probably fine. If you find your baby skipping a feeding, sleeping straight through to the, the next feeding, that could be a problem. And it's often an early sign of illness if your baby's not waking up at the expected time for a feeding. So if they're going more than six or seven hours in a row without waking to feed, give your doctor a call. Keep your baby smoke free. You've heard the, the difficulties of secondhand smoke. Babies are even more prone to some of those difficulties, and they include an increased risk for infection, influenza, respiratory infections, an increased risk of ear infections, because that's part of the respiratory tree, and also an increased risk of colic. And for fussy babies, some of that exposure to smoke can make them even fussier. So if you can't quit your smoking yourself, at least make the commitment that you're going to smoke outside of the house so that your baby is not getting exposed. The back to sleep campaign, that just means when you put your baby to sleep, put him on his back. Babies will have a much lower risk of sudden infant death syndrome and will be safer with that back sleeping position. And the last one is when you're getting ready to go to your doctor or the next well child visit, go ahead and make a list. Most mothers will tell you that their memory was shot somewhere during delivery and they just can't remember all the things they wanted to bring up at the doctor's visit. Go ahead and make a list. We don't mind you bringing that list in. Or even better yet, give us a call at 292-BABY. That's 292-2229. And we'll help answer some of those general questions so that you can save your specific questions for your doctor when you come in to see him for your visit. And those are your newborn tips for the week. 292-BABY is a community collaboration of many community partners, and it's administered by Monroe Community College. What you're seeing is a list of those who are supporting or have supported the efforts of 292-BABY to reach out to help support parents and caregivers of infants. We would like to thank each of these contributors for their own unique contribution to this effort.